Welcome to our section on calcium homeostasis and hormonal regulation. First, we're going to start talking about calcium. The endocrine system maintains blood calcium in a normal range. Cellular and tissue effects of calcium depend on blood calcium maintenance within a specific range. We always have a circulating blood pool of calcium that is in constant flux. There are several organs involved in this process, the small intestine, the bone, and the kidneys. For example, you may eat something with calcium in it. Some of the things that are high in calcium include things like milk, spinach, kale, broccoli, um, even things like uh, almonds I've heard have had a lot of calcium in them. From there, the calcium is absorbed in the, the intestines, and from there it goes to the blood, as you can see in the middle. When it's in the blood, it is in a constant flux of being stored in the bone, and it can also be immobilized from the bone back into the blood if calcium is needed for another function within the body. So a lot of people think that your bones, once they're made, their calcium stays there. Well, your body is actually capable of pulling calcium out of the bone and back into the bloodstream when it's needed for things like heart contraction, muscle contraction, things like that. So it can actually um, go back and forth, and it is in constant flux. Excess calcium can also be eliminated through the, ki through the kidneys and the urine. So let's look at some of the hormones that control calcium metabolism. First one is vitamin D. People hear vitamin D and they actually think it's, it's a vitamin. It's not actually a vitamin, it's a hormone. And it shares striking similarities at origin with steroid hormones. It is a metabolic product of cholesterol synthetic pathway. So you need cholesterol in order to make vitamin D. There's several organs in this process, including the skin, the liver, and the kidneys. And it affects tissues such as the gut, the bone, and the parathyroids. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute which depicts all this, but the whole thing starts with de novo synthesis in the skin. So de novo refers to the synthesis in the skin. And we have 7-dehydrocholesterol transformed into vitamin D3 by the act of ultraviolet light. You may have heard people say, oh, i got to go outside and make some vitamin D. You do need light from the sun or another light source in order to make vitamin D in the skin. But we can also get it from fortified milk, multivitamins, and cod liver oil. This is the picture that I was referring to, and I love this picture because I'm a very picture person. But the first thing that happens is that 7-dehydrocholesterol, in the presence of light, which is what this little um, symbol here is for, causes the conversion of cholesterol to turn into vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 travels to the liver, where an enzyme called 25-hydroxylase gives us 25-hydroxyvitamin D. 25-hydroxyvitamin D then travels to the kidney, and with 1-alpha-hydroxylase gives us the metabolically active 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. This is what's needed for the tissue-specific vitamin D responses. Another hormone that helps control calcium is parathyroid hormone. You can see the thyroid, which we have talked about briefly in um, the previous chapter. And I referred to in the, uh, the, the uh, recording about these little corn, look like little corn kernels, there's four of them stuck in your thyroid gland. Those are your parathyroids. So your parathyroid hormone is secreted from those four parathyroid glands in the region of the thyroid gland. They have calcium sen sensing receptors in them that respond to calcium levels by increasing or decreasing parathyroid hormone. So in essence, what it does, it stimulates bone resorption and release of calcium into the blood. It acts on the kidney to increase the reabsorption of renal tubular calcium and it drives the production of active metabolite. It also promotes intestinal absorption of calcium. All functions raise blood calcium and are mediated by a specific parathyroid hormone receptor. So this has a very large control over the amount of calcium in your blood. The next one we're going to talk about is phosphorus a little bit. One thing you need to make note of about phosphorus, an increase in parathyroid hormone will cause an increase in calcium. 
Parathyroid hormone has the opposite effect on phosphorus. If you have an increased level of parathyroid hormone, you'll have a decreased phosphorus. This is called a reciprocal relationship. You will usually never have a high calcium and high phosphorus or a low calcium and low phosphorus. One is high, the other is low. One issue we can have with the parathyroid gland is hyperparathyroidism. That is a overly functioning parathyroid, overly functioning parathyroid. In this case, a person with primary hyperparathyroidism, we would see increased calcium and parathyroid hormone with a decreased calcius, cal phosphorus. That all makes sense. In secondary hyperparathyroidism, we would have an increased parathyroid hormone and phosphorus and a decreased calcium. This is caused by an inability to excrete phosphorus in somebody with renal failure. So secondary hyperparathyroidism is usually a cause caused by renal failure. Another hormone is calcitonin. Calcitonin is a hormone that is produced in the humans by the parafollicular cells of the thyroid. It acts to reduce blood calcium by inhibiting vitamin D and parathyroid hormone activity. So let's look at some of the organ physiology with the calcium metabolism. Well, think about somebody that has GI issues. Somebody with a normal intestinal function will be able to absorb calcium um, quite readily. Somebody with an abnormal or dysfunctioning GI system, such as short bowel syndrome or having a genetic or physiological defect, would not be able to adequately take up the amount of calcium needed. They would also have issues with the normal vitamin D availability and metabolism. So you need to have a normal GI physiology to be able to absorb these items. On the other end is renal physiology. If you have diseased kidneys, it can impair calcium metabolism. It's very difficult to excrete calcium or phosphorus if your kidneys are not functioning properly. Let's look at the bones for a minute. In the first couple slides, I told you that calcium is stored in the bone and it can be immobilized out into the serum when needed. Well, there's always a bone turnover going on or remodeling per se. It's a coupled process of simultaneous bone formation and breakdown occurring throughout life. Bone formation is mediated by osteoblasts and the breakdown is mediated by osteoclasts. When resorption ex exceeds formation, bone mass decreases and we have an increased risk of fracture, sometimes called osteoporosis. We do have two types of bones in the skeleton in case you're curious, cortical and trabecular bones. Um, you're not going to be tested on this, but usually we see the cortical bones in the femurs and the trabecular bones in the vertebrae and other types of um, connections. One of the diseases we can have is hypercalcemia, or an issue we can have. Um, this is where blood calcium levels are above the expected normal range. When we look at the calcium in the human body, and we talked about this in the prior chemistry course, 50% of circulating calcium is ionized or free, and the remaining 50% is complexed with serum proteins or albumin. Binding of calcium to other substances must be taken into account when considering total calcium levels. For example, a patient with a low serum albumin would be expected to have a low total calcium and a normal ionized calcium. This is why the ionized calcium is usually a better indication of somebody's calcium status. Now if somebody has a high serum albumin, we could um, expect the opposite. Uh, pH affects the binding of ionized calcium to proteins as well. So this is why um, that ionized calcium is so important. So what are the signs and symptoms of somebody with hypercalcemia? Well, they can have central nervous system issues, GI issues, renal issues, skeletal problems, or cardiovascular issues. So it can cause a whole myriad of symptoms. We can also have endocrine, cause, endocrine causes of hypercalcemia. Primary hyperparathyroidism, this is the most common cause of hypercalcemia in an outpatient setting. The there's a physiological defect in the parathyroid glands themselves and that usually results from some type of an adenoma or hyperplasia of the parathyroid glands. So if you have an overacting 
parathyroid gland, you have hyperparathyroidism. That would cause high calcium. You could also have hypervitaminosis D. This is caused by an excess intake of vitamin D or a lot of production of the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Other things that can cause it, cancers. Um, multiple myeloma is an example of something that can cause a release of hormones or hormone-like substances. Another disease, um, milk alkali syndrome, also called Burnett syndrome. This results from the ingestion of large amounts of calcium together with an absorbable alkali. I'm thinking of something like Tums, okay? Um, your parathyroid hormone level would be low in that case. Renal failure is another one. The renal excretion of both calcium and phosphorus is severely impaired. The production of active form of vitamin D is limited and parathyroid hormone secretion is stimulated. We do have some medications that can cause hypercalcemia, such as thiazide diuretics that can cause a retention of usually filtered calcium. We hang on to it rather than um, letting it go. Lithium, that can cause an issue, and vitamin A. Another issue we can have in the opposite end of the spectrum is hypocalcemia. This is the state of blood calcium levels below the expected range. Again, best measured by ionized calcium. Some of the symptoms are tetany in the hands, feet, legs, back, Schwatek sign, which we'll see in a minute, numbness and tingling, central nervous system disorders again, and um, cardiovascular issues. We're going to try and watch this YouTube video here within my screen, and I've never done this, so let's see how it goes. And we'll skip this video here. There we go. So we're looking for here is that Trousseau sign and Schwatek sign. When they apply a blood pressure cuff, her hand will start to contract. Here's the Schwatek sign. They tap on her face and you can kind of start to see a neuromuscular excitability on the side of her cheek. And it's kind of like under her nose there. It's difficult to see. Okay. How about here? Okay, so as you can see, she had some, um, some symptoms of having the low calcium, the Schwatek sign, and we also saw a Trousseau sign too. Um, you get the tetany, and that's what the tetany is, that um, freezing up of those muscles. All right, Hypo another cause of hypocalcemia is when your, hyp or your parathyroid glands um, will not only correct falling blood calcium, but also prevent it by increasing parathyroid secretion. Um, compensatory rise in parathyroid hormone secretion is known as secondary hyperparathyroidism. 
Um, some of the features that distinguish the secondary from the primary is usually the parathyroids are functioning properly, but an increased parathyroid hormone is the appropriate mechanism. Treatment usually involves identifying and correcting the process um, and treating the hypocalcemia, but not uh, removal of the parathyroids. Some of the endocrine causes of this are um, neck surgery, usually if they remove parathyroid glands or removing the whole thyroid itself in the case of thyroid cancer would cause a problem. Um, it would not be able to release parathyroid hormone gland, but parathyroid hormone anymore because the gland would be gone. You can have autoimmune destruction of the parathyroid tissue, mutations in the parathyroid gene, abnormal deposition of copper or aluminum in the parathyroids, or magnesium deficiency as well. Now the girl that we just saw in the video had pseudohypoparathyroidism, and that's just a lack of responsiveness to parathyroid hormone. So her body would actually secrete parathyroid hormone, but her body wouldn't react to it the way everybody else's does. Hypovitaminosis D um, can cause a low calcium, and there's also something called tertiary hyperparathyroidism, but we're not gonna go into that in detail. Some of the organ systems that can cause a low calcium, um, intestinal disorders resulting in an inadequate calcium or vitamin D absorption. Some things would be short bowel syndrome, dumping syndrome, celiac sprue. Um, these threaten hypocalcemia and have an increased parathyroid hormone secretion. Having renal insufficiency or failure is a problem as a result of hyperphosphatemia and defective metabolism of uh, vitamin D. We can also have genetic defects resulting in an impaired ability to recover filtered calcium from tubular fluid. Just like the hyperparathyroidism, there are medications that, have, that can cause hypoparathyroidism. Examples are anti-resorptive agents, medications that stimulate bone resorption, lithium, thyroid um, diuretics, and recombinant human parathyroid hormone. So just as a review, what color do I draw calcium in? Well, you can use citrate, oxalate, um, or actually citrate, oxalate, ethylene, diamine, tetraacetic acid, or EDTA should not be used because they form complexes with calcium. Heparin, although possibly involved in fibrin precipitation, act to inhibit thrombin and factor 10A, thereby preventing coagulation. So your best option would be a red top or a green top tube. Do not use blue, gray, or purple. A couple bone diseases I'm, gonna, diseases I'm gonna make mention of here because we are kind of talking about bones with the calcium are rickets and osteomalacia. You need to know the difference between these. Rickets is usually caused um, in children. It occurs in growing bone and their bony deformities from the bending of long bones due to gravity, usually a deficiency of vitamin D. Osteomalacia usually occurs in adults after the closer, closure, closure of epiphyseal plates. There's no bony deformities here. Bones just get softer. So we'll talk a little bit here about osteoporosis, and I, my titles got cut off up there. You can see from the picture on the right-hand side, osteoporosis, we have larger pores, this, they're not filled with calcium like the normal bone is. This is the most prevalent metabolic bone disease in adults. It affects 20 to 25 million Americans with a four to one female predominance. It's believed to cause about one and a half million fractures annually in the United States. Usually we have to do a bone scan and we can see um, fragility fractures sometimes if uh, they do have weak enough bones. In order to treat this, we usually direct the primary, look at the consequence of the disease or a fracture, treat that first. We need to look at some risk factors. Do they smoke? How much alcohol consumption do they have? We have to evaluate if they are a fall risk. Do they have adequate dietary calcium and vitamin D? And we need to look at prevention for those with a family history because we can uh, minimize the bone loss, increase bone density, and prevent fracture. There are also medications available for the treatment of osteoporosis. Um, some of the things that the, you may see on TV, for example, would be um, Boniva, I think Sally Fields is the person who goes on and does, um, I do my once a year Boniva treatment. That helps um, make the bones a little bit stronger to make them less apt to, um, to break. So I have a few more YouTube videos here if you want to go over what causes hyper and hypocalcemia. I'm not going to make you sit and watch them here. They're available in your PowerPoint online. 
but um, these do go over the details of the hypo and hyperparathyroidism again.